Well, good morning. I'm Jason Tyra. Um, I am a certified public accountant. I run a uh, firm in Dallas that focuses on tech issues, and this is a big part of our practice. Um, I've been in this space for about four years now, and every year I think this is gonna be the last year when, when we're like the only ones doing this, or almost the only ones doing this. And every year it does not happen. So my four person firm is still, um, to my knowledge, one of only a very small handful of CPA firms that are willing to do this kind of work. Um, and I think Daniel Winters is another one and he's floating around here somewhere. Um, and he'll be giving a presentation that covers slightly different issues, I think, tomorrow. Um, I originally had, had this for an hour, and uh, I think I'm down now to half an hour. Yeah. This is... So he'll be up for about 20 minutes, and then uh, we can do about 10 minutes of, of Q&A before our next speaker. That's well, the most we got. Here, here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll take the whole 30 minutes. Just interrupt me with questions anytime. Um, I, want, I want this to be kind of an interactive thing. I think it works better that way. Um, so what I want to talk about is, is current issues in virtual currency taxation. Uh, this is a collection of about, I think, five questions that I get over and over and over. And especially this year, uh, there's a lot of new adopters because of the, what the price has done uh, in the past 12 months. So these are issues that, that tend to come up. They're not really new issues, so if, if you're familiar with taxation with virtual currency, I'm probably telling, something, telling you something you already know. Uh, but again, feel free to interrupt with any questions that you have. Um, so the substantive guidance in this space was originally provided by the IRS in 2014. It's technical notice 2014-21. It's about four pages long, and it's the only guidance that's ever been provided. And essentially what 2014-21 says is that virtual currency is property. And the term the IRS uses is virtual currency because it covers things other than crypto. Um, give you a little background, the working group that created this originally was focused on things like World of Warcraft gold and Counter-Strike skins and things like that. So uh, things online that really had a gaming focus uh, that were, uh, where the IRS noticed that there was actually value being exchanged but not taxed. So that's what we have. Um, and because it is so short, um, we have to sort of interpret how that would apply to uh, the virtual currency space given uh, what each individual taxpayer is doing. So, for instance, you might be a professional trader and what that means to you is different from her who it, you know, would be like just trading for her own account. Um, there have been no uh, private letter rulings issued since then, so there's not any kind of direct um, personalized guidance that we can look to. There have not been any tax court cases that have been litigated since then. And this is three years later, uh, over three, almost four years later now. So, um, so there's not a lot. And um, what I'm going to tell you is my professional opinion. Uh, another CPA might tell you something that is slightly different, hopefully not completely different. Um, but again, you know, feel free to interrupt. Um, okay, so first question I get a lot is when are my gains reportable? And the answer is in the year when they occur. Um, you, you must recognize income for tax in the year when you, when you realize it, okay? Um, one common misconception is that um, unless I cash out to fiat, I actually don't have any tax due, and that's, that's not correct. Um, when you trade uh, actively or even when you don't trade actively, anytime you trade, if you, if you recognize a gain, that's, that's when that's actually taxable. Um, and those are called disposals. That's, that's the, the IRS term for any time you, you turn loose a piece of property as a disposal. Uh, mining proceeds are ordinary income. Uh, they just go on the, I'm sorry, go ahead. So anytime you trade, but if what you're looking for, like Bitcoin, Okay, so, so, Think of it like with a, with a security. If you buy a stock and you just sit on it, regardless of what it's worth, you haven't actually realized a gain until you sell it. And it's the same with virtual currency. But if I trade one Bitcoin for however much Ethereum, I haven't cashed out to dollars, but the IRS requires you to treat that transaction as if you had like an intermediate part where you sold for cash and then used the cash to buy something else. And that, that sale, uh, where there's a gain or, or a loss, 
that's the part that's reportable uh, on, you know, on your taxes. Yeah, that, that's not that's not a disposal. You're, you you just can't sell to yourself. Yeah. So I might be jumping the gun here, but um, as far as talking about trading, sending from one crypto to another, mm -hmm. how does IRC code ten thirty one contain lifetime exchanges factor into that? That's like four slides away, but we'll get to it. Okay. Okay. And I don't know if you also have up there, but um, as far as mining proceeds go, I'm doing that. But if you're running something like a proof of stake code, is that the same as a mining? Is that the so I'm, I'm actually not familiar with that technically what it is but I'm assuming it generates a stream of revenue okay so it, anytime you have revenue coming in you, you're gonna have tax due and the IRS doesn't really make a distinction um, in terms of, of technically how you got the revenue it doesn't matter um, so you'd still have ordinary income in that case um, that really that transaction could actually be divided into two components because when you receive it you have ordinary income and then let's say you hold it for a while you have capital gains uh, on you know the difference in value between when you got it and when you got rid of it does that does that make sense you're shaking your head i'm not i just want to make sure i've answered your question Well, you're, you're only looking at it at, at certain snapshots in time. So the day you receive it, there's that value. The day you get rid of it, there's that value. The delta between those two is your capital gain. So you, you really don't have an obligation to, to like check it every day. You're just looking at it at, at those particular times. Okay. okay. Sure. So if I'm mining for Zcash and every three hours I get 0.01 Zcash or whatever, um, am I going to need to make a transaction in the spreadsheet that says at 3.01 a.m. on the central time, uh, that day I went to this one website and it told me that that 0.01 Zcash was worth, uh, you know, a dollar, and now I've got a capital gains reportable instance for that one dollar, and I'm going to do that thousands of times over the course of the year. Now perhaps I could just increase the instead of getting it every 0.01, I get it every one Zcash or whatever. But it seems like a ton of transactions. And, and at the risk of sounding flip, my, my answer is, do you have to do that? Yes. Okay. And that, and so that's, that's why people don't like 2014-21. Okay. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's, you can develop some strategies. Nobody really knows how the IRS is going to look at this. So let's say you have some automated means to, to only do this once a day. And you, you, out, you, you, know, you aggregate those gains once a day and take you know, whatever the price is at that time, and that's what you put on your spreadsheet. That'll probably work fine, um, but it, it won't be as accurate. Um, so right now, IRS has this set of regulations. What if in the future they change it? Would they backdate it for the prior years that they, you know, they did it before? Okay, so sometimes that kind of thing happens, but but usually not. Is there a um, precedent for having a retroactive application of new tax laws? Yes. So there is a process for the IRS to uh, introduce what are called proposed regulations. And uh, there's actually a whole uh, spectrum of regulations that were originally introduced as proposals that have been proposals for like decades because the IRS has never closed the loop on finalizing them. Um, in this space, I, I just I don't see that happening because the, the treatment is already so generic and so basic that uh, what what you would really be looking at then is a carve out that would generate uh, refunds, and at least it, in the tax sense, you have three years to claim a refund, so there would be no benefit 
really beyond three years to having a law be retroactive. Okay, uh, we're, uh, we're gonna move on, so uh, I'll, I'll get you. That's why I said this is like two hours worth of material and we have hardly any time here. Okay, um, so if you're trading for your own account, you can either be uh, conducting business if you're involved in the trade or business of virtual currency trading, basically if you're a day trader. Um, but for most people, it would be considered a hobby or a personal investment activity. Um, for hobbies, uh, your losses are deductible to the extent of your gains. So if you're running you know, uh, some kind of mining rig at your house or whatever, and you make $10,000 this year from mining uh, virtual currency, you can deduct up to $10,000 in expenses of you know, costs of equipment or your electricity or, or whatever it is. If you're actually doing that full time or you want to say that, that you know, that's a business activity for you, you, you can in deduct more, um, but your tax outcome will probably be uh, not as good. Uh, in that case, you'll be subject to self-employment taxes on whatever you earn. Um, the way that you value your holdings will, will be slightly different, uh, or it can be. Uh, you could adopt uh, mark-to-market -market accounting, which would require you to update your, your value every day with the mark-to-market -market piece, or at least at the end of the year. Um, so, um, so yeah. Well, it's not, it's not something where you can like go back and forth year over year. So the IRS looks at substance over form, um, and I, if I, I think I understand your question. And so if you're, if you're doing that, like if you're manipulating um, pricing by taking, you know, today I want to take the average value and tomorrow I'm going to take the low value, or, and then the next day I'm going to use this other pricing source or whatever, so that you can, you can generate sort of like a curated result, that, that's probably going to be disallowed under audit. And, and the reason is there's, there's no economic substance to it beyond uh, reduction of tax. Okay, I mean, there's there's no business rationale for for manipulating pricing data that way. Does that answer your question? It, it does, but most other countries are well, well, yeah. I mean, I and and okay, um, okay. Uh, so this is a new thing this year, the the forking, and uh, this has been a pretty controversial area, and uh, the reason is there's not any direct. Uh, there's not any directly applicable examples for any other asset type. There's, there's, I mean, there's no other asset, at least that I can think of, where today I have one of these, and then tomorrow I have one of these, and then something else that's totally different. Um, the closest that uh, most practitioners have been able to find would be a property split, uh, like in a divorce. So for example, if you have, um, say I have 10 acres of land, and uh, I divorce my wife, and my wife walks off with five acres of land, and I walk off with five acres of land, then what we have then is a, a basis split between the two, okay? But nothing new was created in that transaction. It's still the same 10 acres of land. We're just dividing the basis, you know, by ratio between the two of us. Well, that's not what you have with, uh, with a fork like what happened back in August. You have something that's totally new. You couldn't trade it. Uh, Bitcoin Cash could not be traded prior to whatever, August 1st or whatever day that happened. Um, so you have to be a little bit creative about how you mark your basis for that transaction. So here's three alternatives which are currently kind of floating around out there. Um, I personally believe that alternative number one is the way to go, and that's what I've been advising clients to do. Uh, that is basically to mark it as a coin with a basis of zero. Uh, it would be the same thing as like if you found an asset on the ground. Um, or it got dumped on a helicopter at you or something. Um, and then whatever you, your holding period basically determines what your gain is. So if you have a holding period of more than a year, then whenever you uh, dispose of it, whatever you got for it was a long-term capital gain. Uh, alternative two is to treat the first tranche as ordinary income. So let's say it's worth $100 when you, when you get that coin. You recognize ordinary income on that day of $100, and then you go to capital gains treatment over time. Uh, An alternative number three is uh, the kind of ratio example, like with the property split. Um, 
I, I don't think that would work, and, and it's actually kind of complicated if, if you look at that to try and figure out by the market values of the two and like what, how much the market value of this one declined and, by, and, and how much this one went up or whatever. Um, but that is you know, one of the methods that's been floating around as a way to uh, determine basis. Like-kind exchange treatment. Okay, I, I get this over and over and over. It's probably the number one question this year because people have uh, booked so much in gains. Here's the thing. Uh, in case you don't know, uh, uh, Internal Revenue Code Section 1031 basically allows you to defer gain on the disposal of an asset when it is exchanged for another asset of like kind. And an exchange means an exchange. If I sell my house and then I take the cash and I buy another house, that's not an exchange. Uh, unless it's set up properly uh, using the rules under Section 1031, okay? So where traders are wanting to use this is I'm trading, you know, high speed every day between um, Bitcoin and Litecoin and Ethereum and, and whatever else. I don't want to report any of those until I finally cash out. So I'm going to call it Litecoin and I'm just not going to report anything, okay? That's not, that's not the way to do it. <laughs> um, there's no statutory reason why 1031 should not be allowed to work with virtual currency. I get asked about it a lot. I've not seen a fact pattern where, where, it, where it could quite work yet, uh, mostly because of timing. Um, but there are rules, okay? Um, the code specifies that you must identify the asset that you're giving up, you must identify the asset that you're getting in exchange, and the identification requirement um, applies to the person facilitating the transaction. So like if I'm, if I'm doing my disposal on Coinbase, I have to provide Coinbase with a written uh, notification that I'm claiming a deferral of gain under Section 1031. And in that example, there's no mechanism for you to provide that information to Coinbase. So that makes it pretty hard to, to claim the treatment. Or if you're trading you know, uh, you know, on a decentralized exchange and you don't know who the counterparty is, so it's impossible for you to provide notice to that person. Um, after you identify it, uh, there's a 90-day, I think it's a 90-day window uh, where you have to pick up a new asset either before or after the transaction occurred. So if you are trying to defer gain on an asset um, and, and you're, you're setting it up where it's not a direct thing, you have to uh, involve a third party intermediary to hold the asset for you until you can complete the transaction. And again, that uh, becomes an issue on a decentralized exchange where it may take 20 or 30 transactions to actually fill the order. Now you have 20 or 30 counterparties you have nobody in the middle. It's impossible to have somebody in the middle. So that would kill your, uh, your 1031 claim right there. Um, and then, like I said, in most cases, you're not going to be able to use Section 1031 because the transaction that you want to defer a gain on has already happened, or you just didn't set it up properly. So, so this is the answer. It is possible. There's no statutory reason why it wouldn't be possible. Um, but uh, it, it has to be set up and, and planned for in advance. And we have some other issues here. I think Daniel Winters is going to talk about more of these uh, tomorrow. Um, so uh, FinCEN Form 114 is otherwise known as the FBAR. Um, the IRS is, is like the, the IRS is not FinCEN, but they run FinCEN uh, or, or they speak on behalf of FinCEN. The only guidance ever received on this was like an offhand verbal comment at a, an ex at a conference, I think. And they basically said, we're, we're not worried about virtual currency. Um, what I'm advising clients to do is to file it anyway. It's, it's, it's too easy to, to just do it. Um, and this isn't specifically for virtual currency. This tip, this is, uh, the FBAR applies to foreign financial accounts. So if you have an account at an exchange overseas, that's when the FBAR requirement would be triggered. Um, there's the case down in Florida uh, last summer. It was a state law case uh, dealing with money laundering. If you're not familiar, the, the Cliff's Notes version is that um, I think it was Homeland Security set up a sting uh, for somebody selling uh, Bitcoin on local Bitcoins. And they told him uh, to his face, we're planning to use this to launder money. And he's like, I don't care. So he sells in the Bitcoin and they arrest him for, for basically conspiracy. Um, federal uh, uh, US attorney didn't want the case. It was a dog. Uh, so it goes to state court in that case. Um, state uh, DA, whatever, picked it up goes to trial and the judge dismisses it. And the answer is because uh, when you have no money, you cannot have money laundering. I don't think that's, that's actually the answer. You know, I, in, in that guy's case, it kind of worked out. 
Um, but we're still short on, on guidance in terms of like what, you know, when are the, the anti-money laundering provisions triggered or the know your customer requirements? To what extent are they triggered? Um, you know, what, what, what are some fact patterns where you can actually get into trouble uh, consistently and not just, you know, based on some rogue homeland security activity? Um, ICOs are attracting more scrutiny, and because of that, it's going to become more difficult to do an ICO without uh, recognizing income. You basically have two scenarios here. Um, if your ICO is a security, you have to register. Uh, it's, you know, you could, so that you have a registered offering of securities, okay? Um, most people want to do ICOs so that they don't have to register. So that kicks you back into selling a product, essentially, and that's also when you would, you would have income on the sale of your token, okay? So it's becoming more difficult to do that uh, based on increased scrutiny. And as a result, a lot of ICOs are gonna look uh, not so good from a tax perspective. Um, um, can you, I saw a headline about, right here, okay. sorry. I saw a headline about Tezos the other day having to return the funds that they raised by ICO. Can you comment on that or what was the reasoning why they're having trouble? I'm not familiar with that case, but if I had to guess, my totally uneducated guess is that um, they were the subject of SEC enforcement action, and essentially what they were told is, if you just undo this, we'll let it go. We realize you didn't, you didn't actually mean to, to stage an unregistered offering of securities, but the cure is undo it and, and this will be forgotten. Go ahead. So um, I think there's a difference when classifying, at least from SEC perspective, about security versus file uh, utility tokens. Uh, could you comment on that and see the difference between the two and uh, for the taxation purposes? So the, the, the basic difference is if the token comes with the ability to participate in management of the company, uh, and so, the, uh, you know, an example would be the, uh, the DAO token. Um, that is a security, all right? If you're just, if it's just like pre-purchasing something, like the right to use a service, for example, or the right to exchange for a product in the future, um, the uh, Bolt tokens that uh, uh, the guy that went before me was talking about, that's an example of something where you would have income because you're really just selling a product. It's a virtual product but it's, it's, it's the same as like if I went online and bought you know, a music file from iTunes or, or, or something like that. Say again? Kickstarter. Or Kickstarter, exactly. So that, yeah, so that's the same model. And um, you know, Kickstarter does not allow you to buy equity. Why? Because it's not allowed to have a uh, general solicitation of online uh, securities except through regulation CF or regulation A+. So, um, as the SEC starts to look harder at these, you know, now you're looking at something where you can get $230 million in income, except you're going to have to pay $70 million in tax on that income. Uh, and there's, there's some kind of creative ways around that, which are, uh, you know, I, that we've been able to put together for certain companies. Um, but for the most part, you're, you're probably just going to have tax due. And, and unfortunately, the downside of that is once you strip that stuff away, they become less attractive to a lot of investors as you know something they want to own. So, so my next question is: They raised two hundred thirty million dollars. By the time they got the notice from the SEC, the value of those tokens had had gone up to about four hundred million. So, what happens with that one hundred seventy million delta? Well, okay, I'll tell you what what's not going to happen, <laughs> and what's not going to happen is they get to keep that one hundred seventy million dollars. <laughs> um, that, that's called disgorgement. It's when basically you have to give back uh, ill-gotten gains. So um, I'm not sure if that would be forfeit or if the, the original investors would, would get that, that uh, appreciation, but I suspect that once the ICO is undone, that market value is just gonna be wiped away.
So going back to 1031, does your firm have, or, or do you know of a place that might have um, like a, a, a list to follow or a set of procedures whereby an investor or a trader who says, okay, well, I really want to take advantage of deferring my you know taxable events and maintaining a cost basis for my investments, where if you were to follow this certain set of rules or stipulations, those trades could be considered like kind of exchanges under 1031. I know one example when you were talking about having large volume orders that maybe be filled by, you know, multiple sellers. I know a lot of exchanges have the ability to select, you know, fill or kill. You know, if, if you can't if you can't fill it all at once, then don't even do it. So, are there you know changes or stipulations, or is there that you know of a list where you could say, okay, if you do these things in this order, that's considered 1031 com compliant. Well, okay. Well, Section 1031 is the checklist because it tells you what you have to do. We would not provide that kind of guidance because I, I don't want to get sued, basically. Um, at least we would not provide it outside the context of you having retained my firm as, as our client, okay? Because then we have privity, and now, now I can give you advice that you can pay for, okay? And we don't have to worry about, or I don't have to worry about just handing you something and say, do this, and you're all good, and it doesn't work, Okay. Um, but, in, but in theory, there's some way if you were to follow all those rules as a yes. trader, you could make that happen. Yes, but here's the thing. And the number one, the most oppressive part of 1031 is you have to file a form. And it's like a two page form, and you have to do it every single time. So, so now, let's say you're a high speed trader, you've, you've traded 90,000 times this year. That's 90,000 copies of that form. It's two pages. Uh, we got uh, we got about another minute left on this. So if there's anything else you want to wrap up in your talk, or if you want to take more questions, no, um, I'll be floating around. I, I really wanted to take longer to do this, um, so uh, just just grab me if you have questions. Uh, I'm I'm here to to answer them. So thank you. Thanks, guys.